the la well, last but not the least, because the reason for putting this talk last, Jeff, is that Jeff is an MD, PhD, AM, and he's been working in the field treating pediatric tumors with protons, but now he sets the direction of which research should be done. So it's nice to be in the field where you know where you came from, but also where the field should go. So he's the medical officer of, for the clinical radiation oncology branch at the radiation research program at NCI. And he's, oh, let me just admit somebody, okay. And, oh, sorry, sorry, okay. So, um, and, and he's basically responsible for supporting research grants and contracts advancing translational and clinical recent radiation therapy. So he gets to set direction, which is nice. And so he, he's looking at developments, evaluation and management of multidisciplinary research programs. And this is one of the things that we've been very careful in showing you all week is that this field is really multidisciplinary. So the idea of working together with a range of different experts and keeping that going to make that progress, having started with the example of the very first patient treated with hadron therapy in Berkeley, as I said, not surprisingly, because one Lawrence brother was a doctor and the other one was an accelerator physicist and they were surrounded by a multidisciplinary team. So this is what we are really talking about. And, and, you know, and he's also looking at new technologies, not just hadron therapy, but biosensors, the interface of various fields. And, and as I said, his interest is focused, both focused and broad, which is very interesting because I'm waiting to hear what that means. And looking at quality assurance, pediatric radiation therapy, LINAC research, et cetera, et cetera. Enough from me, but I'm going to pass you to, so Jeff and, uh, and you know, so title, quality assurance, key aspects of safety and particle therapy to consider from Beam to team, and I was talking about beams to dreams. So please, Jeff. Thank you, and good morning. It's quite the honor and the privilege and sort of a fun position to be the last speaker. So after me, you got, you're sort of done. Not really, she has a whole session plan to go over the course, but I'm the last official speaker. So I'll try to be succinct, focused, and I want you to relax and just listen to this from the 30,000 foot perspective, the big picture perspective. Every single slide could be delved into at depth and we'll never get through it if we do that. So let's make sure that the things are working. Disclosures. I work for the National Cancer Institute in the United States. I have no conflicts of interest. I have no vested interest or intentions. There's basically, I'm not making any money doing this. I didn't accept any money from Manjeet. And I give you one take home message. So don't worry. Go ahead. And one thing I do recommend is she's a very wise, very kind, and very brilliant scientist. And she does this kind of course and these things out of the kindness and wisdom that she is made of. And I would listen to her. And I'll just leave it there. Learning objectives to make it clear how important quality assurance is to everything we do, everything with an underline to comment on process and to comment on the literature and what people do at a high level. So the most beautiful science is that which is reproducible. And then I thought, how do I better say that? The only science is that which is reproducible. And what you see on the left is a flower that was made in 2010 at the Proton Center in Indiana. And I'll keep showing it because it it was spot scanning and they didn't use spot scanning there because they thought that the process of quality assurance getting it through the FDA would be too cumbersome. So they went with uniform active scanning and I'll, I'll just leave it there where the, where the field went, but they were doing these kinds of pictures in 2008, 2010. So where's QA? Does any student want to interject and say, where is quality assurance in things? Go ahead, anybody. Silence. You, I hope you can all hear me right now. Yes, we can hear you, Jeff. All right. Well, to the students, it's everywhere. When you put on your clothing every day, somebody's made sure that the clothing works and someone's made sure that the door closes and someone's made sure that the water faucet doesn't leak, at least when they sell to you and your car works. Every, QA is everywhere. So we're learning from protons and from carbon. 
we're learning that the RBE is not 1.0 and we're learning through some science that you need to take into account the edges of things. And just the very day that came into play in a tumor board yesterday, because in the pediatric setting, we don't go to 59.4 gray like we do in photons and protons. We only go to 54 gray. It sounds trivial, but it might matter because people don't appreciate this in the clinic, that there is a difference in dose at the edges of not just the beam end, but the edges of proton beams and carbon beams. We try to define biological dose, and we've been doing that for some time, and we're still not there yet. And we cannot learn lessons unless we can trust our data. And we've built some beautiful, elegant machines, and we've heard about many of them during this week. And they truly are elegant. I've been to HIT and I've been to Canal and, and, and to NERS. And every single point in a beam line needs to have process of quality assurance, ideally in real time. Super complicated, super important. Why? If you treat a patient, you can't untreat that patient. You can kill people if you don't do these things correctly, or you can kill the field. A story I can tell you is I got hired at Indiana to be the pediatric radiation oncologist in the third proton center in the United States. And the man in charge of the center said to me, Jeff, you're the peds guy. We have adult people. We have five of them. If one of them hurts a patient, it's a minor lawsuit. It's annoying. It's bad, but we, we will continue. If you hurt or you kill a child, the entire building will be shut down. So quality assurance matters. I, as a clinician, have to trust the physicist and the biologist and everyone along the way that what the prescription is, is actually what the patient gets where they're supposed to get it. It's a team effort. I'll get to that later. So in the United States, we've developed something called IROC. And IROC is a grantee of the NCI they're based out of MD Anderson and out of Philadelphia and out of Rhode Island and several other places in, in St. Louis and Ohio. But it's, it's a multi-centered imaging and radiation oncology core that designs, that designs and implements quality assurance practices across the clinical trials. So they do site qualification, credentialing, data management. And why is that important? You need to know the data in your clinical trials is real you need to know that if you ask a hypothesis, you're actually going to be able to answer the question and test that hypothesis. So there are currently 25 protocols open in the United States that allow randomization between protons and photons asking really comparison questions. And it's very important that both sides of the equation are done exactly the way they're supposed to be done. So you can actually find out if they're different, if there's one that's better or one that's worse. There are many, many opportunities around the world, they're getting asked questions, can they do QA for centers? And for example, we, we've recently invoked uh, trying to get Manchester into the NCTN, and they're going through these kinds of processes now to get IROC certification and such. So what is the reason for IROC? Well, the reason for IROC was it became very patently clear that the enterprise that is the radi radiation oncology and clinical oncology testing network in the United States. Now it's, an, it's actually international Canadian and, and international sites as far as Australia and Europe and India and Japan and some areas in the Middle East. Um, there are 2,200 different clinical testing sites. Okay, 2,200 sites. And you need to know that the data from those sites can be compared. Not all of its radiation data, but much of its radiation data. It's a big question. It's a big issue. So this is a, the, the total NCI budget every year is about $6 billion a year. This infrastructure, I don't have an exact number, but I've been sort of told around a billion a year. So it's not inexpensive to do this. And the idea is that these tests and these data will help everybody in the planet. So QA is important, it's part one. The fundamental part of everything we do, all of it, every day, everywhere, all the time. Can we trust the results of trials? Do we understand the biology of regular radiation well? If they don't do good QA, you don't know what those plots mean? Do we capture the data well? So QA doesn't just start with the actual, is it the right dose? 
Are we storing the data correctly? Do we communicate it well? Do we put our biases into that data? Do we employ equity? Are there both sexes in the data and the testing? Are people different races in the data? Are we enriching the data unbeknownst to ourselves via some sort of bias? What kind of economic issues are behind this? What kinds of economic issues are behind the actual delivery of the treatment? In the United States, it's thought that you need to have a proton center. You can only support a proton center where there is a major league baseball, football, some sporting team. And that, that's a whole another story, but economically, can you do the work? It's not cheap to do good science. Do we validate our preclinical work? Do we fund the preclinical work? Do we reward the preclinical work and the funding and the validation of such? Do we demand validation in our work? Are we rigorous enough? Do we have realistic models? We've heard about models this week. Models are often not perfect, but do we rely on them? Do we understand their limitations? Do we over rely on them? Are the models flawed because of poor quality data that went into them? Do we actually study our failures? So here's an example of communications and decision-making and the quality of one's data. So if you read through my slides earlier, you, you sort of cheated ahead, which I never had the time or inkling to do when I was a student, but some of you might. These are real data from a real disaster based upon communication of data. And this is part of quality assurance. So this goes back, th this was data from the O-rings from the space shuttle and the Challenger. And the O-rings, this is, these are cracks. This is a fancy word. I didn't know this word before the lecture for cracking and, and basically when rubber gets cold and cracks and turns brittle. So around no cracking happened in normal temperatures, like hopefully what the room is where you're sitting. But as we all know, as you get colder and colder and colder, rubbers and plastics tend to bet brittle. And this is that O-rings data. And what happened at the Challenger incident, and this is the forecast over here, so you can imagine what it was. What happened at the Challenger incident was whoever was in charge of the data decided that none of the zero cracking data points were interesting. So they just didn't show it to the engineers. So the engineers didn't see this at all. These, this line here, they just saw this. And so they estimated, oh, it's not that bad. They, they were wrong at that time. But anyway, it turns out that if they had actually had proper data communication, which is part of quality assurance, they would have seen that there's an 80% chance that the O-ring would have failed when they were launching. They would have never launched that space shuttle. So process and team. Process is something radiation oncology is very good at. We've had to become good at it because of Every time there's something that every rule that you run into is because someone did something that required the rule to be made. So every process, everything you see is either because something very bad happened or because someone was smart enough to realize something very bad could happen and they want to prevent it. So quality assurance isn't just measurements. It isn't just error bars. It's setting up the process and setting up the capacity to do things properly. It's not just quality control. It's actually the environment of quality, the communication of quality. These are things you'll read if you go looking on quality assurance on the internet, you'll see definitions. The bottom line is you need to be in a culture of quality. We heard from two different people involved in the real world, the industry, and they talked about the science being the first part. Then they talked about the whole process being at least as much of a, you know, a complexity and challenge as the rest of it. Other words could be used. So this is that kind of stuff. This is for IMRT, which is traditional photon therapy. We have robustness reporting that goes on in the particle therapy space in the United States. And you'll see that it's very, these are, they have to be rigorous so that people actually do it properly. You can't just hand wave this stuff. So what do you do about quality assurance? What do you do, the students in the room, this is what I tell my students, my colleagues, this is what I tell myself. Learn what is done at your center and why. The why matters. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? It's a pain. Why do we do this every day? It seems stupid. 
Why do we do that, sir? Why do we do that, ma'am? There are reasons. Ask, don't be shy. Master it, study it, improve it. Teach it, publish it, fix it. Learn what's done everywhere else. Different people have conquered different problems inherent with the designs of their systems. The canal system may be very different than the, well, I know it's different than the nurse system, but it's very different than the semen systems. They have different QA processes. They have different, you know, different approaches. It's worth knowing why. You'll be smarter, better, and a more capable scientist if you have a better appreciation of the differences of the data sets out there that are going into your field. And collaborate. That's the take. There's, collaboration is crucial to the success of this field and every other field. It's a very diverse field, very expensive resources, very important patient care questions have to be answered. Collaboration is the only way forward. You cannot solve the problems in the field safely in a silo. So you build in random deep checks. You don't just allow the standardization, the process to sort of run autopilot. You, you test it. You break things and see if you can pick up breaking things. Do preclinical QA too. So the laboratory work that goes into animal studies and cell studies is at least as important as the human stuff because that's why we start the human trial because we have promising data from the cells and the animals. And if we miss something that's dangerous because we weren't being careful along the lines of the preclinical work, we're putting humans at risk. That's not acceptable. So as an example of that, we have four grants in the NCI that I happen to be the program officer for and we put $50,000 a year into each of the four grants over five years to pay for the dosimetry, to hook those up to the NIST or National Institute of Standards set of photon preclinical standards. In other words, they had to prove every year that they're getting their dosimetry done rigorously. It's a team sport as well. That means it's not just you as the scientist, as the physicist in the bunker, it's your whole group. So I'll talk about a star shot. So a star shot at the Proton Center where I worked was the biggest pain in the rear end of all the different things that physicists typically had to do that wasn't considered an act of God, like the beam lines not working or the cyclotron. We, we had a water tank once break and we got a trash can, 20 gallon trash can full of water dump into the vacuum chamber of the cyclotron. That's a disaster. You can't QA that kind of thing. It was up the next day because of the quality of the physicists and engineers, but that, that was a physics disaster. Normally, a star shot is part of your normal behavior. That makes the gantry isocentric. That checks the isocentricity of the gantry. In other words, if I'm treating a patient in their brain and I have a millimeter left or right where I tolerate near the optic nerve, and if I go too far over, I can hurt the patient, I can blind them or kill them. I need to make sure my gantry is what I want. And these are you know, very heavy, very big things. They're really challenging things to do. Well, the robots that you've heard so much about, they have clinical operation and then they have non-clinical operation and they get a big keyboard, at least the ones we had, that are they, they look like there's something out of a nightmare in a science fiction movie with about a hundred buttons and knobs, and but they're, they're really not something you want to touch with patient care. But the physicists have full access to the auto road. These are all usually automobile sourced robots and one one person i'm not going to name names but one person by mistake drove the robot into the nozzle of the machine after five years it happened and took a chunk of carbon fiber out of the tabletop well rather than just move ahead that person knew that they had to report it they reported it we shut the machine down for about eight hours, we did a star shot to make sure that everything was aligned because we did a calculation that the amount of force the robot delivered to the nozzle was potentially enough to knock the system out of alignment. And then resetting the system in alignment is a whole nother issue I won't get into. And running codes. So this is a picture. So when you treat patients, I treat children. We would put the kids, if they were young, really young, to sleep because it's hard to stay still for 20 or 30 minutes when you're five years old. It's impossible for most kids. So this is a cranial spinal board that we designed and invented. And this is a child on that board. And this is an anesthesia machine. And what you don't see is when the patient goes into the vault, there's a 30 foot line between the machine and the patient. So you develop a, a new way of thinking about all the different numbers you see on the screen because there's dead space that changes the 
all the numbers from being what you think they should be to something else, which is confusing. And we track this. And I'm looking at this. We had 4,045 anesthesia events when we published a paper, and we had three episodes or events. And what was an event? An event was when something bad happened. So at one point, we had aspiration because children eat food and they don't tell their parents even they're, even when they're told not to eat, if they sneak food. So you can that's why you're not allowed to have food when you get an anesthesia. And one fell off a table because someone wasn't paying attention to them in recovery. And that someone ended up getting terminated at the institution, but that's a whole nother story. So the process, I'm gonna go, I'm switching back to process. The IROC process is baseline approval and then credentialing. So first you have to get checked out that you sort of have a machine that works and then you have to pass tests. So first they do output checks. And this is the, these are actual real data from the US proton, mostly US proton sites. And you'll see that they're usually spot on, but there's a distribution. And these are some of the phantoms, just pictures of different phantoms. Some are static, some are kinetic. They move. And it's hard. And again, some data. This is an example of the head and neck phantom. These are the things that they have to address to pass the head and neck test. So I won't read this out to you to save time, but they 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 have to do a plan and deliver it to this phantom. So they scan the phantom, deliver a plan to it, and then they treat the phantom. And then all those data are sent back to IROC and they analyze this. They look at the electronic and they look at the actual physical delivery. And it's pretty interesting. So I want to talk a little about, and, and Manjeet, I'm trying to stay a little bit ahead of schedule so that people actually get some time back for conversation. If I end early, I hope you're not mad at me. Um, but I think at the end of a week of lectures, people, you know, sitting still can be painful. Um, so quality or QA literature, comments, and thoughts. This is the third point I wanted to drive home. And this is that pretty picture again. So preclinical quality assurance is really not in such a good place. And most people don't appreciate that. So I'm gonna tell you right now that radiobiological studies have not been done. There, there are good papers. This is one from Michael Bauman and his group. It's excellent. They talk about what they've done. This is a typical paper. It's, it's infrastructure descri description. It's rigor description. It's, it's needed. It's good. It's in the field. That's a great paper. We have quality assurance in particle therapy. And I just looked at the Google search for articles. And there are 3,700 papers in the literature on these search terms, radiobiology, particle therapy, QA. It doesn't mean that they're all based on that, but that's how I found this article. Drug radiation combinations. This is an article with my boss, Norm Coleman, and a bunch of other people that are known to the field. The short version, and I'm not gonna read, I chose not to read it out loud, obviously the whole article, but essentially it showed that there's a real need to do quality assurance in reporting and that most of the things out there in the literature probably could not be reproduced when they mix drugs and radiation. That's just regular radiation, forget particles for a second. And then this was a paper that came out that shook the field a few years ago. A dose of reality, how 20 years of incomplete physics and dosimetry reporting and radiobiology studies may have contributed to the reproducibility crisis. And this had editorials, this had comments, the bottom line is they found that they did a very rigorous paper. They looked at well over a thousand papers in highly cited journals. They actually found it was less likely to have the kinds of parameters you need in the publication to actually reproduce the work. So if the closer you got to a, a journal like Science or Nature, the less likely you would be able to typically reproduce it in their words. So I just interrupt you for a second, Jeff. You said we could interrupt. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah. You yeah. just made this statement, which is really horrifying. Mm -hmm. Because every time one sees an article in Nature and Science, one thinks this is the best reported data, which is in one of the big, highest cited, highest impact journals. So you've just told me something which is really worrying. So what does one do? I, I, I said that on purpose. I know this is being recorded. This is a published paper. I think this this, this was in, in, I forget the date, but was it not that long, 19, you know, early, pre, just pre-pandemic, then people sort of got, you know, the pandemic happened. So I think a lot of this, this kind of stuff got 
sort of overshadowed by issues of can I even go to the food store now to get my food and is there food at the food store? Um, but this is important. I, I, you guys have the slides, you can read this paper, you can read the editorials and comments and you can make your own decisions on this. I'm throwing this out to the, this group and in particular the students because it's your responsibility as the future to be rigorous and not let these kinds of articles keep happening. So the reason I asked the question was precisely because our young students are launching their future careers and they take nature and science as a, the acid test for really good literature. So please, what Jeff is saying, you can't take it at face value. So thank you. I, I, I think that's true. And I remember when I was a PhD and I had to do an experiment, I could go into bio, I, I wanted something in biochemistry, the journal of biochemistry, 1960 something. So I went back and I, I pulled the paper First thing you realize is people back in 1960 were brilliant. People always think that just because they're alive now that they're somehow smarter than them. No, that's not true. So you, you get the paper and they spell out the process, the procedure ad nauseum to the point where it was better than my own lab notebook in terms of how to do it. You go to a journal now, you can't tell how to do things. You just can't. Anyway, that, that's, a, that's an aside that could take us six hours of conversation over, over uh, at least at least one cappuccino from the cafeteria. Um, so preclinical radiobiology, this, so this is a paper that was published in 2021. This group of people are very closely associated with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is uh, an institution that handles US um, traceability for radiation. And I put a star here so you don't have to read the whole thing, just to, to show a point. The range of radiograph doses that were measured deviated from standard doses, this is across the radiobiology labs in the United States, by 12 to 42%. Think about that, 42% variation. They're submitting this for evaluation. Okay, so whoever did it thought they were correct because these, are, these aren't just like, these are academics that are sending things into this group of people for evaluation and they, sent something in that was 42% off. These are not typically, you know, mom and pop shops. These are people that are assistant associate, or, you know, at least the postdocs. So the uncertainty was 2.5. I mean, it wasn't terrible, but they, they're trying to make a point here. And they show that they've addressed radiobiology. They, they took this as a shot across the bow and they've developed these various methodologies to, to put rigor into the radiobiology dosimetry, which were lacking and, and to some degree still are lacking. So they made models of the actual tubes. And I've seen data in my practice, and this is public data. So I, I, a lot of the stuff I, I see and I can't talk about because it's not published or not talked about, you know, it's not, I can't talk. But in these kinds of plates, the dosimetry, when you put them in a radiator, a micro radiator high throughput system, the dose of the outer, Wells is different than the dose in the middle because of the angle of the plastic and, and you're using ortho voltage or very low energy. So these are things you as students have to keep in mind. There's, there's subtleties in what would be considered something pretty simple. And they have mouse phantoms, they, they have test tube phantoms, and they, have, they know that their devices have different response characteristics and they, they can calculate that. They're, they're, very, they're good at what they do and they're demanding. So, Let's look at particle credentialing in the United States in patient treatment centers trying to get approved to treat patients on NCTN, like I told you that big consortium. Um, they wanna get approved. They wanna be allowed to treat. So this is, this is a first paper that came out and these are some updated data. I'll just skip down here. You can read these out, but it's 100% passing would be this flat line here. Clearly across these different kinds of phantoms, and I apologize for the font size, I would look at this on your screens when you have a, a, a moment. It's you know, 80, 60 to 80% passing. That means 20% of people that have a machine, these are proton centers. So these are the star centers. Okay, these are competent people that, except for my old center, which was not commercial, they're commercial systems. So they pass through all the different things that you heard the two people that were speaking earlier today about all the different credentialing and processes and certifications. So they're using certified machines and they can't pass the test 20% of the time. And here are the numbers bigger so you can read them. The liver thing, it's a moving phantom. It was one of the ones I showed earlier that has motors that move. 
the pass rate was only 52% as of May, 2022. Prostate, it doesn't move at all. That's the, that's the money maker in this country for radiation. 18% of places can't pass. I mean, I, I, I look, I'm, that's, that's why I care about this. Because if you're a patient, you want to know that, that your place is, you know, passed. You don't want to know that, you know, you don't want to be. And so some places haven't gone through this and they're treating with protons. And I don't, I don't like that, but that's another issue. So the value of on-site, the short version is, 32% of institutions failed at least one lateral beam profile measurement. And this, this, there's a value And the bottom line of this take home message was going to the sites and for IROC's team to go to the sites and give them advice and analyze what they're doing wrong and teach them was valuable. So this is a back and forth. This isn't just the, you know, the big ship saying you've failed. If you fail, they go back to you and they talk to you and they educate you and they train you up. Our interest isn't in making people feel bad. Our interest is in raising everybody to being good. And you have a 5% variation. You can, you can be off by 5% and pass. Don't think that passing means you're perfect. Passing means you're close. So we had a, a recent study, some of you might know about, which was a lung cancer dose escalation, proton versus photon and dose escalation. So it's really sort of four arms. There was photons, standard dose and a higher dose in lung. And then there was protons, standard dose and a higher. And everybody thought, oh, the higher dose in lung cancer would be better and the protons would be better. And eh, not true. Um, it turned out that dose escalation didn't work and the protons weren't that much better, if at all better. It was actually a negative trial. And because of that, it's received a lot of resources to study why. And the first thing that happened was we looked at the proton planet and they had allowed pencil beam. Okay, so this is the this is the IROC measured. So this dark line or this darker line down here is what IROC measured their beam outlet. And this is what the institution had submitted. And why is it different? It was because of pencil beam versus Monte Carlo. So as a result of that, and this is from Paige Taylor, who's a, a, a very promising young physicist who's going for her PhD soon and, and, and someone I've trusted. She's the one leading the IROC proton group. So I contact her when I have a proton issue. And when we came up with new NCI guidelines for particle therapy, which are on the web that you should all look at since you're in a particle therapy class, she and I and a bunch of other physicists were in a room for a day to come up with that, that working document. So pencil beam versus Monte Carlo and other disease sites. And since we've seen, I'm, I'm just gonna show these data. So you wanna be zero, okay? You want the Monte Carlo to be the same as the regular beam, okay? That, that would be perfect. It's not, it can, be as, it can be four or 5% off. And obviously lung moves and has different densities. That's the worst. But prostate, ironically, isn't perfect. It's really only safe in breast and liver in this context. And so I'll just stop there and just say that there's a lot going on. The QA is very important. Do not assume everything that you see, everything being done is perfect. Do not assume a center that has a proton machine is giving a dose that's perfect. And we, you know, I, having this IROC infrastructure is absolutely critical, in my opinion, for science in the clinical space in particle therapy. And we've made that available to the Manchester group because we mandated it, they're gonna become part of the NCTM and, and do part. And that means they're a full member. That means if a PI at, at Manchester wants to ask a question, they can bring in that entire infrastructure on a clinical trial. So I'll, I'll get to that if we have time at the end. So here's the question about flash, here's an example. So an editor named uh, uh, Farr, who is part of the Adam group, who some in the room on the phone call might know. Well, he was at, at um, Indiana and he was at St. Jude and now he's in, um, I think Switzerland. He contacted me in, in his role as an associate editor and said, Jeff, can you help write this article about QA and Flash? And Flash is something that I'm, I'm and others are highly um, optimistic, but, but concerned that it's, it, it gets adapted before we've been able to even make sure it works. Okay, so the current thinking in my mind, and this is me, it's not the NCI, it's not the world, is it might spare normal tissue 
but that doesn't necessarily pan out because we've never tested across multiple fields. We've never tested across multiple days. So if you give a single field and give these huge doses, maybe it helps, but we, there's so much unknown about it that I can't bless it for clinical studies at this point. What, what this paper did, and you'll see the, the again, there's Paige Taylor. So you've got uh, Jean Moran, who's now a very senior physicist at Sloan Kettering and David Joffrey, who is currently at MD Anderson, but was at Toronto Children's and is the person who led the development of the cone beam CT. And then, you know, this, this dumb guy at the end, okay? So the short term, all the infrastructure to test the stuff needs to be invented. And it can't be proprietary. If you have a vendor says, yeah, we can test our flash, we have to, no. It has to be a third party that says, yeah, it's flash or it's not flash. So tools to test reproducibility, DICOM. So the DICOM standard has to be able to handle these ultra fast things and pulse. The, the, the actual fine structure of the delivered dose, people don't realize this, or you guys do because you're in a CERN class, but it's not this even beam. The, the little, the pulse structure of delivered dose might biologically matter a whole lot. And the conversation between uh, Manjeet and, and Dr. Blakely the other day was telling. And I would, I would ask all of you to go back and listen to that a few times. That was some very important thinking going on. But that being said, first, you figure out how to QA it. You figure out how to stop the machine in the middle of a flash dose in case it's not giving a flash dose. And the biggest concern is some people think that it has to be between say six or 10 gray and 20 gray to be flash. So let's say that you're giving something to a patient and it turns out it's too slow to be flash and you stop it, you stop it halfway. Does that mean that if you turn it back on, you can't give flash anymore anyway because the dose is outside of the flash dose regime even if it's fast enough. I mean, so there's a whole lot going on with flash we don't understand. How to, how to share the idea of flash, how to visualize flash, how to uh, look at a plan, et cetera. Midterm, multi-fraction, multi-field, RVE issues, which we're still struggling with RBE with static normal fields, let alone flash RBE. Correlations, et cetera, et cetera. And then long-term trials. And I, I'm not gonna read this. This is an, an open source paper we put out in medical physics in a special journal. And I would ask, it's free, download it, read it, do whatever you want with it. But we made it free so you could read it. So we have to integrate the preclinical QA and the clinical QA. So we need to make sure that everything is done rigorously from the beginning to the end. So, the standards have to be done and validation methods have to be done so that they correlate and they can be translated all the way from cell to human in theory. Computational methods, AI, ML, quantum computing, QA and, uh, that has DEI, okay, diversity and equity, et cetera. Those things have to be also QA'd, okay? It's not just the physics dose or the cell cultures or the the, the source of the cells to make sure that when you say they're V79 cells, they're really V79 cells, they don't have a virus in them. That's QA too. So the cells, the animals, the strains, is a person got a, you know, patients are variable. Some patients might have heart disease. Some patients might have blood pressure disease. They're, they have polypharmacy. How do you do a study properly if the patients have 600 different drugs on board while they're getting whatever you're doing? Mean, it gets really complicated instantly but you have to do source code and computer code QA. New physics, affordable high T magnets, how stable are they? Machine design, these are some of the things we've heard about in this, this lecture this week. Research support. You know, people like me have to pay for QA and we have to, I mean, you want someone like me knowing that QA is important because at the end of the day, it has to be paid for and it's not cheap. And so people in research organizations around the world have to know this, value it, and put it forward. And I, I try as hard as I can. I have a wonderful mentor, a guy named Norm Coleman, who believes in this and has been very, very instructive to me and helped me become what I am in this. But it's, it's a team effort. But it's key that you guys have the resources you need to be successful. My job is to help all of you be successful, period. Pharma. Pharma has to have QA. We recently had, it's, it's public. We had a pharma company that has, that makes, I think it's lutetium. They have a stop for six or eight weeks because there's, there's something going on. They haven't been 
totally, they haven't said what exactly is going on, but they have two sites and both sites have shut down. So the world supply of this radiopharmaceutical is currently off and we have clinical trials with this. Patients that want, want this or need this, it's not a fun time. That's public. That's what I can say publicly. So you need to know the limits of how the studies and research has been done. You need to know, you know if it's been done well or not. You need to be able to read about how they did it. You need to enrich our patient selections via biology that's valid. In other words, men, women, minorities, rich, poor, different countries, different diets, different pre-existing conditions. We need, to, we need to not just cherry pick our data, we need to make the data realistic and document that. Data science with rigor. So we have to invite people that are data scientists that know how to do QA in their world, i.e. source code analysis, et cetera, testing, because at some point, Artificial intelligence, the only thing that can test artificial intelligence is another art artificial intelligence model. Because you can't use the data used to build the model to test the model all the time. So it, that, that's a whole nother level. That's, that's another lecture. We need to focus on broad data availability. The only way to really do good QA is to put your data out there so people can test it because they might find things you didn't find that you made mistakes with. So being open, collaborating is critical to quality. We need to focus on mentorship, expertise, diversification, and collaboration. So I, I like to think that Manjeet's taught me quite a bit, and I'm trying to act in a way that you know she's taught me to act in. And this kind of class is super critical. All of you are the future. There's nothing more important for me than to help you guys make the future a better thing and to do it right. And Manjeet is one of the champions of that on the, on the global scale. So carbon beam QA, I had to talk about something carbon beam because I'm in the CERN course. So what to do about QA, remote versus on-site. 80% deficiencies could have been identified through remote work. This is back to IROC, but 20% couldn't be discovered through remote work. They could only have been discovered if you're on-site. So to properly do QA in this consortium or any other, you really need to have people going on site that do the QA that are not from the site itself. You need a third part, in my opinion. You don't have to do that, but it, it's people generally don't find their own mistakes as well as when people come in from the outside. So I'll leave it there. Carbon QA from the NCTN point of view. We wanted to parallel the process so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We think that on site's important and RB is important. So they have been collaborating with the CNAO site in Pavia. And I wanna to say to anyone from CNAO and anyone on, the, on this call that I visit there, that the, Sandra Rossi and his whole group is fantastic. They're very kind, they're great hosts. Everyone in this whole consortium, I visit almost all the sites. Everybody is great. The people inside of the, the carbon community in Europe and actually Japan too, fantastic people, good scientists, good collaborators, wonderful people to work with. They've been great with the team. It turns out that things are different. The current dosimeters used are poorly characterized in carbon beams, surprise, surprise. And this shows, they, they study this and they can see the different kinds of devices and how they behave differently and they have different efficiencies. And one thing that people don't like to talk about too much in carbon, but it's a big problem is there different models that are used for picking doses? And there are thousands of patients that have been treated on each model for the most part successfully. So it begs the question, can you merge these models to be coordinated or is one model right, one model wrong? It, it, or do we not know enough to know what's right and wrong? Well, that raises some other questions. Uh-oh, yeah, this is not supposed to be like this. Anyway, these are the different models. And most of you should just realize that they are based on different cell lines. And some are microdosimetry based, some have Monte Carlo bases for the beta component of the linear quadratic equation. I'm not gonna repeat what the linear quadratic equation is, it is a radiobiological formalism that looks at survival of cells. It's been developed for many years. It's, it's not perfect, but it's how a lot of us in the field talk to each other. Okay, and basically alpha is the first term and has to do with single breaks 
in single hit to cause a break and betas multiple hits to cause breaks it, there's more than that okay and there's there's a lot of i, I don't want to misspeak so i'm not going to say anything and there's some people on the phone call that are probably far superior radiologists than i so i defer to anyone else in the call to correct me the bottom line is these this is what i talk in this is how i speak so, okay so, so, so jeff, go ahead. jeff mm -hmm. five yep. more minutes because you are raising some very interesting questions and i want to leave enough time for discussion understood i appreciate that so okay. i'm almost done I have two more slides, so this is perfect. So this is just to show you, this is the alpha. These are V79 cells, so one cell line. And this is one, one paper. And it was in, an art, in a journal that, believe it or not, Frontiers, it's not, quote, the most prestigious, but they're sometimes the most rigorous with getting all the data. And these are some of the sub-references. One, one of the sub-references is to one of our friends, Marco. And this looks at alpha and this is beta, okay? And these are the different particles. And these are the different models here and the, the different models. Will. And you'll see that a little bit, they don't meet that well in the alpha term, but they're better, the two di the different models. Yeah. But if you, if you look at the LEM and the MTM models, they, once you get into 150 KV, this regime over about here, they, they don't meet it. They don't meet it all. And that's the that's the overkill regime. That's the beam entry regime. That means we don't really understand biologically what's happening before we get to the target. And that, to me, as a pediatric radiation oncologist, is concerning because you have to have that high energy to get to deep targets. That means we're doing things to patients we don't totally understand in the in the throughput side of things. And potentially, even though it's very low dose, if we're doing particle therapy imaging, as we've heard about. We don't biologically have a complete handle on what might be done to those cells. Are we causing epigenetic problems? I think that's where Eleanor Blakely was, was going where she said the low dose regime is very important because a lot of the low dose regime is that entry dose by default because it's not gonna be the exit dose in the particle therapy unless you're doing imaging. But that's just a comment, that's an opinion. So final thoughts. We need to focus more on the interface of biology and physics. That's where all of you come in. It's not just enough in this field to be looking at just a cavity or just a cell. You really will come into your own in terms of opportunities to change the world if you work on that interface. And in the context of that interface, you have to improve whatever the basis sets are that you're working within anyway. So you'll broaden the field and you'll accelerate discovery by working at the interface. That's a rule. And I think there are more opportunities in terms of, let's just say grant funding, if you're in that space than if you're doing the routine stuff. QA in this context is very complex, difficult, and a research topic on its own. It is fundable to do QA work to make this kind of stuff safer and better for people. We need to embrace collaboration. QA is a critical part of that. In fact, QA can drive collaboration and should. We need to bring all of our tools forward to share best practices. If you make a mistake, you need to tell people about your mistakes. That's something that, unfortunately, the field likes to hide mistakes. It's just human nature. I don't want to tell people that I, I had this clinical trial and all the, all the people in the experimental arm died twice as fast. That's not popular. I'm hoping someday we can change that. And it's something we work on we, you know, at our level. We need to mentor and help each other. On, that's what Manjeet's doing and I'm doing and every other person in this volunteer level, faculty level, and even you students are helping each other. So this is what, that's what I'm preaching the choir. And we need to make sure we do QA at every level and appreciate the fact that every single thing we're doing has to be reproducible. And that is it. I'm gonna stop sharing and you guys can attack me now. Thank you, Jeff. So Joe, over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, Jeff. That was a really great and very important topic for us, especially working in the field of particle therapy. So I'll go to the students for questions. So we've got a question from Krista. Yeah, thank you. I will uh, agree completely to what Joe said. I mean, it was very, very interesting and comprehensive lecture. Uh, my question is, I guess, mainly related to the IREC phantoms that you mentioned. So is this suppose it's like a full end-to-end -end testing, like what are the lessons that you've learned with these audits? Like where are like the key sort of 
mistakes or errors in our like in like the therapy in general is it like more in like beam data or like some mechanical misalignments of the machine or what are the most prevalent issues errors you find with these audits um they, they range and so some of the mistakes are uh commit a lot of these things come down to commissioning um, the commissioning of a particle therapy beam is complex, and we've moved into really doing Monte Carlo commissioning. Some of the mistakes that happened before don't happen anymore, but some of the mistakes will, and it'll be more difficult to detect them with Monte Carlo um, if you don't do your Monte Carlo correctly. So the number of people that have to know how to do proper commissioning is a group of people that needs to be trained uh, and maintained and grown. Um, Assumptions about treatment planning systems and applicability of things is always a big one. So there's a disconnect between, let's just say someone who understands the physiology of the lung or moving uh, tissue in a human and a physics uh, guru who may not think about things outside of wave functions. So you have two different people, they're brilliant, they need to talk. And a lot of times mistakes happen from a lack of communication. Um, most people don't realize this, but the ventricles in the brain with every heartbeat move about a millimeter, maybe 1.3 millimeters. Okay, so your brain is vibrating with your heartbeat. So when you do stereotactic radiotherapy to the brain, you'll hear a lot of people, neurosurgeons included, that will say, oh, I'm doing this gamma knife, I'm doing blah, blah, blah. It's important to realize that the brain is not a static thing, and most people don't know that. The prostate with breathing can move a centimeter, sometimes three centimeters. So, you know, that's an outlier, but a centimeter is a typical excursion of a prostate. So if people do, um, they, they, they assume things. You, you, generally people are their own worst enemies. Um, so assumptions are bad, data collection is bad. And unfortunately, some kinds of errors in particle therapy centers propagate. So if you make a commissioning mistake, there's nothing you can do to fix your, you know, that, that, that's an error that just keeps going. And the only time you can detect it is often at the end because your treatment planning system is telling you something that you wanted to tell you because you told it what to tell you, if you follow what I'm saying. So did I answer your question? Yeah, 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 you did. Thank you, thank you a lot. Okay, so we got the next question from Kendall. Uh, thank you very much for a very nice and impressive talk, doctor. And I was really impressed on your opinion about the reproducibility because I am currently researching on anti-CP models and I figured out that many of the anti-CP models are not reproducible. So one of my idea is to increase the reproducibility of the anti-CP model. However, my question is, there are many questions that I want to ask you, but I will go for several first. So first, is there any idea that you have to improve the reproducibility of the anti-CP researches? And the second one is that you mentioned about the AI or machine learning models, but they are statistical models, which means that we don't know where they are reversed and where, where they are failure. And you mentioned about them to introduce stop. it. And you mentioned about- Stop, 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 stop. You, you're, asking, you're asking great questions but I'm never going to be able to answer you because I won't remember your first question if you keep going on your second question. <laughs> so it's, it's my limitation. Okay. So, <laughs> no wait, wait a sec. So normal tissue complication modeling, okay? That's, that's a tough one. And it is, it's an important, just answering your first question has been the subject of meetings and is the driving force between how, for example, the Swedish Proton Consortium treats and chooses their patient care and Danish and such. So this is a big question to the rest of the people in the room. So I want to be very careful how I answer this because if I if I'm quoted out of context, I'm going to get half of the half the European community that treats patients mad at me. Okay. <laughs> so it's a model. Models are often wrong, but they can be useful. And and we are working here with Quantec and Pentec for kids and other things, and, and the Europeans have other projects and. The problem is humans have a very large range of normal tissue toxicity. And unfortunately, when you're a physician, you have to bias yourself towards that most susceptible host because of disaster avoidance. You're trying not, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm trying not to kill children. When I, you know, I'm trying to cure a child, I don't wanna damage them. And I have damaged some children with particle therapy 
due to the LET issue, and I published on it. Okay, I, I gave a girl with a craniopharyngeal Kluver Busey syndrome, and so she is she's damaged lifetime. She's she's cured of her, you know, because she had this really weird susceptibility that's not genetic. It, no one understands it, and so we don't want that to happen. So the normal the, the problem with NTCP is if they are super rigorous, we won't be allowed to treat anybody because there's always a chance you can hurt someone. And you need to get to a level of dose that actually kills a cancer. And not everybody's cancer needs the same dose. That's the other assumption. Everyone thinks if I give 60 gray, what's the NTCP? Well, that particular patient, you don't know this. Some of them can be cured with 45 gray. And some won't be cured with 70 gray, same tumor. So a lot more biology has to go into the NTCP. It's a big data problem. And my opinion is the way to solve it is to transfer the work that's being done in the world where we look at retrospective chart reviews to prospective big data collection where data points are collected while we sleep on people and they go into normal tissue complication profiles and it's a learning system. So it might turn out that let's say, let's say I'm getting treated for a brain tumor. I hope I don't get one. Let's say I'm getting, so I sign up for this thing and it follows me. So the NCI has put in into play wearables, you know, wearable detectors. There are things with Apple watches now. You walk around, it can tell how much you move and how healthy you are by how you know how fast you're moving and stuff. All those data go into something. And they study you with your permission in ways that are subtle. So we can really find out what that dose did to you. And those get integrated across the planet so that it's more fair. So someone that is of my background, someone of your background, someone of Manji's background can think that an NTCP model applies to them reasonably as opposed to just a person in New York City or Stanford or Copenhagen or wherever it's from. So I think the idea to support your question, answer your question is the only way to get the models to be more accurate is to increase the scope of the model and data collection. And the only way to do that is to work together and to build a system to do it. And people are working on that. Your second question was AI and ML, right? Yes. Could you, and in 10 seconds, repeat it? And I don't want, that's it, because there are probably other people that have questions. OK, so my second question is that you mentioned about AI and machine learning methods, which is uh, represent, re phrasing the statistical models. And then statistical models, or I would say more phenomenological models are not rigorous when we are failing at some point. And we don't know where it is if we don't have the uh, deductive model. So how they can help us for the rigorous choice or rigorous selection for the patient? All right, I'll try, I'll answer this but I probably won't satisfy you because I'm not sure there's a clean answer that can be stated in a finite amount of time with a finite amount of rigor. Um, AI and ML are early days. They're useful, but they're not, they're, they, they are overhyped and they're over um, hoped for and they're over trusted. They are tools. And the way I think of AI and ML is they're able to handle very large amounts of data in ways the human mind cannot. And that means that there are various kinds of data that an AI and ML are able to integrate and interrogate that we're not equipped to do. So they see patterns and things that we don't see patterns. They see frequencies of things. They don't get bored. They don't get tired. They don't come in with male chauvinism or female chauvinism. Or They don't have any biases. They're not hungry. They haven't had a bad day. They're, it's a machine. And they're limited. So if someone builds a bad AI and ML, there's bias, you can build bias in the, that's a whole field of, of science where people are trying to remove bias from AI and ML based on the training sets. So the short version is, that's a very complex topic. They are going to be and are useful in imaging analysis because they pick things up the human eye can't pick up, but they are tools and they have to be looked at as tools. They're not necessarily end truth and it's a very fast moving field. The key is the data set you're using to train them drives their limitations. So the quality control goes into the data sets and goes into testing. And at the end of the day, you will ultimately need an AI to test an AI. 
they get too complicated to test anal, anal, in an analog human fashion. So I'm not probably answering your question to your satisfaction, but I tried to answer it as well as I could without saying something so stupid that I get in trouble. Did Last that help? <laughs> thank you, Jeff. Yeah, we have thank you very questions. much. Okay, so we have a question in the chat from Coyote, and he says, thank you very much for the lecture. Concerning radiobiology experiments, what are the key steps that can be taken to make sure the results from different laboratories are reproducible? Okay, um, one of the things that people have to do is they have to make sure that their primary cell lines and primary animals are sourced and verified. So in US national cancer, you know, in our NCI grants, we require uh, the actual sourcing of the cells, the animals and such in a rigorous fashion with, with paperwork. And that has to be done. Numbers of passages that cells go through. If you're a radiobiologist, you understand what I mean by that. If they've been involved with um, that you know, virus in the lab, if they've had other things going on, how they've been handled, uh, et cetera. So that animals and such. So there's a very famous set of papers. I got very excited uh, maybe a decade ago when uh, a group in Japan showed, and these are valid data that immunologically carbon therapy did some pretty interesting things with uh, metastatic lung cancer models. But it turned out that two species or two types of mouse had this happen and two other types of mice didn't have it happen. Nobody knows exactly why because immunology is complicated. So that's the kind of thing, when you find an experiment, you find a finding, you're obligated in the radiobiology space at one level to make sure that you, you have it in at least two or three different cell lines, two or three different animals, different strains. You, you wanna make it, because some of these new animals, they're, they're genetic knockout, knock-in, CRISPR, cas based type animals. They're so fundamentally, shall we say, tweaked that you, you, they may not be reproduced. The second thing is you have to understand your dose symmetry. For this group, in this context of this lecture, the machines in your lab, the, dose, the, radio, the radiation delivery machines in the radiobiology space are typically not as carefully managed or maintained as a clinical machine because I treat humans on the clinical machine. That should change. So the 35 different machines across the NIH campus have all been certified, that cost money, you, you know, it's always, that's the kind of stuff that has to happen. So there has to be a QA process that's very rigorous to make sure that your irradiator, be it cesium, be it electric, be it ortho voltage, it's properly run. And the other thing is, the poor postdoc or the poor grad student doesn't always understand how to run an ortho voltage machine other than I need to get out of the room when I push the button so I don't get zapped. That, that's the zeroth level part. But they don't understand that if you put the shielding of an ortho voltage machine in a different way or a different space, or you, you have the animal in a certain way and there's a little bit of metal in the, in the area and there's a high Z material and the holding, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes into this. So basically a smart medical physicist should be involved in the design and development of radiobiological experiments, at least at the get-go, to make sure nothing really stupid is being done along the way and to help the team with the radiation physics because most biologists are not physicists. And I'll stop there. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we have another question from Colonel Don, if we have time. Yeah, I thought that no one is asking more questions. So I have, I really like from the yes, big questions, I'm worried, go ahead. Uh, so one of my research topic is to build a Monte Carlo system for the radiation therapy QA, but I know about the Monte Carlo simulation, but I don't know how to use it. So can you tell me if you're aware of using Monte Carlo simulation in QA? Sure, they, they, they're doing commissioning to um, everything I just showed you. So if you go back to, I, I turn off the slides. If you look at that 0314 um, lung cancer stuff, that looked mm -hmm. at the measured data versus the Monte Carlo pr prediction. That's, mm -hmm. that's sort of a way of using Monte Carlo for QA. Um, I'm a little biased because I know a lot of the people in the Topaz team, which is based on Gion 4. I think Gion 4 you know, came through um, CERN. I, I've used Fluca, I've used the other things. So they're, they're, you know, they're all, they're all strengths and weaknesses. But my, my favorite system is the Topaz and Topaz and Bio system. They're grantee, full disclosure, the MBio Topaz group and the Topaz group are grantees of my group inside of NCI or have been. So I have a little bit, I, you know, I had to know how to use that stuff to, to do a good job managing their grants. But they're all C++. And 
you can look at some of the publications in that space. There's a huge amount of publications. There's a, a really nice meeting in Bordeaux every five years on the Gion, in the Gion4 group. And you can find out who gave talks there and what they talked about and look at those papers. And I think you'll get a good sense of, of what's going on in Monte Carlo and in QA. Worst case is you can ask questions on the Monte on the Giant Four, actually the Topaz uh, um, group, you know about QA and projects and questions. Once you have an idea, you don't want to go in there totally cold. They're not going to do your thesis for you, but they're very helpful and they'll give you advice on how to ask questions and test things. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, I was yeah, in the. No, I think team. sorry, but I think we need to bring this to a close because you know we are five minutes. After and and Gangnam, you can answer, answer ask questions also on Slack, which we will forward to Jeff if that's okay. Because okay, I, no problem. Okay, so I now we are supposed to have half an hour for dedicated students, right? Christoph, Joe, and Cameron. It's very short chat. So yep, yep, just... and then we'll come back at five thirty.